Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at virginiafarmbureau.com. and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful products we enjoy. We'll visit with a Virginia farmer who's been honored for his role in supporting small farm operations. Chef Maxwell shows us how to cook Irish meatballs and with spring on the way, so is lamb shearing season. We'll see how this time-honored tradition is performed. Welcome back everyone. We are here at Virginia State University. It is one of two land grant universities in the state and Virginia is lucky enough that we have farmers that farm all different size operations everywhere in the state. And in fact, Virginia State University along with Cooperative Extension recently honored a King and Queen County farmer for his success in small scale farming. Small scale farms are loosely defined as those with 10 acres or less. The latest census of agriculture reports that out of approximately 46,000 farms in Virginia, more than 16,600 farms have less than nine acres in production. Well, I'm really quite encouraged right now by uh, the number of uh, small farms that are cropping up, if you will. Um, there, there is growth in the numbers. It's because I think largely people, the, 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 the general public, are, are uh, wanting us to be here. Charlie Maloney and his family operate Day Spring Farms in King and Queen County. For more than a decade, they've been building a community-supported agriculture program on the 18 acres that he farms. He now has 175 CSA members picking up orders of fresh vegetables. Customers include families, restaurants, and stores. Because I was executive director of a counseling center, Miriam had a full-time job mm -hmm. in counseling-related work, and we had uh, four children, so we had our hands full with other stuff. But I left my practice uh, in 2001 and started working here full time. And at that point, we were really able to grow the market and grow the farm. And uh, to where now, you know, we're, um, you know, we, we, we both are full time farmers. Yeah. VSU honored Maloney with the Andy Hankins Small Farmer of the Year Award, named after the legendary former VSU Extension Specialist Andy Hankins, who worked closely with small producers across the state. Hankins was a tireless advocate for small farm operators, including finding new market opportunities and network connections. Hankins passed away in 2012. For me, it goes back even before, I guess, they called it the Small Farm Outreach Program to Andy Hankins who uh, was uh, one who, when we started out here in the 90s, uh, took us seriously. You know, Andy would come out here and see what we were doing. He'd bring out other extension agents. He would uh, always support, you know, what we were doing, give us some ideas about maybe some different crops we might grow, marketing, uh, just a lot of uh, good encouragement. VSU's Small Farm Outreach Program provides assistance in a wide range of areas across 25 Virginia counties. Production tips, financial management, marketing, connecting with the U.S. Department of Agriculture programs, and other opportunities are promoted to growers. These farms are often in areas where small producers have limited resources and are at an economic disadvantage. Many of these programs are very practical. Maloney's farm operation received a boost when VSU helped him apply for grant money to build hoop houses in order to extend his growing season. We began to um, um, attend you know, some of the events that they were having at, um, at, at VSU, Randolph Farm there, um, through their extension program and through their small, then later the Small Farm Outreach Program. So began to learn, you know, some more uh, practical applications of, of things like, uh, for example, working in greenhouses and high tunnels, um, growing, you know, more of the uh, specialty kind of crops. It's helped us build a network 
-hmm. if you will, with other people that are doing something similar. For more information on how small farmers can find help through VSU, go to the School of Agriculture's website at agriculture.vsu.edu and search for Small Farm Outreach Program. About a third of Virginia farm operators rely on off-the-farm income to make ends meet. That dynamic is shifting in some areas as smaller producers extend their growing seasons and raise more high-dollar crops to improve their profits. Continuous expansion of the local foods movement is also giving smaller farm operations a financial boost. Virginia is ranked 11th in the nation in local food sales according to the USDA. I'm Mark Viette. Coming up on In the Garden, we're going to talk about choosing the best evergreens for your garden. Stay with us. Horses, food and fun. It's all coming March 24th to the 26th at the Virginia Horse Festival at the Meadow Event Park. Experience three days of family friendly activities for the horse lover in all of us. Shop vendors selling boots, barns, food and trailers. See Outback Horseman extraordinaire Guy McLean show off the traditions of the Australian bush. Visit the Chenery Collection of rare Meadow Stable memorabilia as we celebrate the birthday of Secretariat, America's most famous racehorse. Learn more at virginiahorsefestival.com or on Facebook on the Virginia Horse Festival page. Mark Viet explains how to choose disease-resistant evergreens for your landscape this spring in the garden. Over time, we learn that many of our evergreens that we've had planted in our garden succumb to insect problems, uh, disease issues, could be other associated problems these plants deal with, and they decline over time. So we do learn what you might not consider planting in your garden. And one of the nice evergreens that you'll see in most people's or many people's gardens are the blue spruce but there is a canker now and it's a fungal disease that affects blue spruce and usually from the bottom of the tree as it works its way up the needles fall off so i might not recommend planting this in the garden because there's no real cures for this so it's very important when you go out and select your evergreens you do maybe the best is go online research evergreens research the type and i just put in blue spruce problems right away in the search engine, you're gonna see lots of problems or no problems. At the same time, when you go to buy your evergreens at your garden store, ask the question, are people experiencing uh, growing issues with this plant? Is this the best type or best variety I can have in my garden? Because there's new varieties and new types, especially with junipers, which we'll look at in a little bit, there's certain types of junipers that are better for the garden. One of my favorite plants that has been affected, in fact, all throughout the Blue Ridge Mountains and in the Appalachia is the hemlock. In fact, you know, I remember years ago camping under hemlocks almost as wide as this table. Now they're all gone and they are affected by an insect. It is known as the woolly adelgid and you know, it almost looks like an aphid. It's a small white insect that sucks the juices out of this plant. So keep in mind, if you're gonna plant hemlocks, they are treatable and you're gonna to have to treat them to prevent this problem in the garden. Getting back to what we looked at a few minutes ago, the Colorado blue spruce or the blue spruce normally looks like this, nice and blue, but if it does get the canker, it starts looking like this or like this. Eventually, from the bottom up, it loses its needles. No real control once you've already have the problem. I really do like planting native plants. The native Virginia red cedar is a wonderful plant or juniper that you can grow in a garden. They're a male and female plant. Some years they're loaded with blueberries. Some years they're not. Uh, this is the male portion uh, that will pollinate the uh, female trees next year. The only problem it does get is the cedar apple rust. And this is a rust or fungal disease that affects our apples. As the plants you might consider, 
you know, everybody's got Leyland Cypress. Leyland Cypress gets way too big, but there's a certain variety of Leyland Cypress that is called Gold Rider. Beautiful golden tipped uh, foliage at the tips. Really have found no problems with this. It gets about half the size. It's usually maybe 15 feet wide by 25 feet tall, nowhere near 40 by 60 feet. As to junipers, this is juniper blue ice. So if you're having problems with junipers, you might plant this beautiful blue ice juniper. As to long needled pines, one of my favorites is known as the Morris pine. Again, the key, do the research, make sure when you buy a plant, it's gonna be there for 50 years or longer. I almost consider them then heirloom plants. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Chef Maxwell puts a different twist on a traditional spring recipe coming up next in the heart of the home. From our farms to your table. Virginia dairy farm families are dedicated to providing your family with nutritious, high-quality milk. I'm Dan Myers, a fifth-generation dairy farmer from Virginia. I'm Roy Vanderhyde, a first-generation dairy farmer from Virginia. I'm Gerald Heatwool a third generation dairy farmer from Virginia. I am dedicated to dairy, my cows, my milk, and our land. Lots of families enjoy a traditional lamb dinner every spring. Today, Chef John Maxwell shows us how to continue that tradition with a little Irish twist in the heart of the home. Hi, and welcome to the heart of the home. I'm Chef John Maxwell, and we're here at Meadow Hall, Meadow Event Park in Doswell, Virginia, where we're gonna be playing with some great Virginia foods. Virginia is very, very famous for its lamb, for beautiful spring lamb. We're gonna be playing with some meatballs made from lamb to celebrate St. Patrick's Day with. So these are Irish lamb meatballs. So I've got some ground lamb here. I'm gonna add an egg. All right. All right. And I'm going to add some chopped red pepper, All right. some grated onion, about three quarters of a cup of grated onion, and some herbs. I'm going to add some cilantro and some tarragon and some coriander. I'm, I'm sorry, some uh, thyme right, and some parsley. All right. Now I'm also going to add some grated potato and I've, been, I've kept them in water so that they wouldn't brown out on me. So I'm just going to add them in here All right. and just mix this up. Now, lamb is a fairly strong flavored meat. It's delicious, right? But I'm not going to put any salt in this mix. The reason I'm not going to put salt in it is because salt has a tendency to pull out liquid. So I want these to stay nice and moist as they cook. And we can add salt to it later if we want to. So I've got this all mixed up nice. All right, I'm going to patty these out, at least a few of them, all right? Make them kind of like sausage, like sausage patties. All right. Now we're going to cook these up till they're done on both sides. Now you can make these into meatballs and cook them in the oven, all right? Or fry them on a pan pretty much any way you want to cook them. Okay, now we're going to just cook these for a little while. 
Okay, now I cooked them at a medium high temperature, right, so I could get this nice crust on them. Because if I get a crust on both sides, then the residual heat, the heat that's in there, will help cook the center without overcooking them, and they'll stay juicy. You don't want to, this isn't like pork. So this is lamb, so you want them to be a little bit on the medium to medium rare side when they're finished. But you want them to be nice and firm. Now I'm taking these out as they're done. They're not all gonna be done at the same time because this burner isn't even. Now, this last one is the one I put in last, so it's gonna take just a second or so more than the others. I'm gonna add some garlic to this, and stir it around. Stir that garlic around, let it cook good. Now I'm gonna deglaze the pan. Deglaze means to pull the stuff off the bottom. I wanna pull all the sediment up off the bottom of it. All right, and I'm gonna use this. Now you can use, uh, you can use anything, any cold liquid will deglaze the pan. Now I'm using a little bit of Irish whiskey since this is for St. Patrick's Day, but you could use apple cider if you wanted to, right? or white wine if you wanted to. Right. Now I'm pulling all of that good stuff off the bottom. Now I'm gonna add some heavy cream. Mix that in good. Now this is just gonna simmer until some of the liquid evaporates and the cream thickens up. It's gonna take about three or four minutes. The sauce is just about ready. I'm gonna move this plate over to here because I worked this way a little easier. You can see how the, the bubbles, the shell on the bubble is getting thick and that's telling me that this sauce is about ready. You can see how it sticks to the spoon. Right, I'm gonna cut the temperature off. All right, move this closer. And now I'm gonna dab a little bit of this on each one of these. Flavor of the Irish whiskey, the cream, and the lamb is going to work beautifully together. I'm going to take some of this chopped parsley and sprinkle it around on the top. And there we've got it. We've got the Irish lamb meatballs for St. Patrick's Day celebrating. Every week we make recipes using great Virginia grown food. We make them in our kitchen so you can make them in your kitchen. Join us next week on Heart of the Home when we get to play with more great Virginia food. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on Chef Maxwell's website, chefjohnmaxwell.com. Virginia's sheep numbers are relatively small compared to some western states, but there are still 2,315 farms, raising 85,000 sheep and lambs primarily in the hill country of the Old Dominion. Most are smaller operations with flocks of less than 24 head. In some parts of Virginia, so-called hair sheep are becoming more popular. These are sheep and lambs that are raised solely for meat, not their wool. Their smaller size means that lambs are also one of the most popular livestock options for young people raising their first animals to show. Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they'd worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, but the original promise remains. There's a local Farm Bureau in every county of the state. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Visit our websites at farmbureauadvantage.com and vafarmbureau.org. Most sheep farmers used to shear their animals in the spring and sell their wool. This also made the animals a little more comfortable during warmer temperatures. As Dave Miller reports, there are still some farmers who are keeping the tradition alive. 
The world market price for wool has been depressed for more than three years, so there's little financial incentive for Virginia producers to pay a crew to shear their sheep. As a result, only about a third of Virginia's 85,000 head of sheep are sheared each year. But after more than 50 years in the sheep business, Alvin Thomas of Buckingham County is still going strong. He currently owns about 40 head of sheep and lambs. Most of the sheep uh, in this area uh, are switching over to hair sheep as opposed to wool sheep. Uh, but the better quality lambs come from the wool sheep. Some of the uh, wool breeds have better body conformation, better muscle structure. Thomas says most of the wool from central Virginia is sent to Ohio to be baled into cubes and sold around the world. As the tradition and market for wool has declined, it's becoming more difficult for producers to afford the necessary gear to shear their own flocks. A shearing equipment collector himself, Thomas says buying all new equipment could cost a beginning shearer close to $5,000. And it takes time and practice to learn this specialized skill. This uh, method of shearing sheep is called the Australian method, where the sheep shearer holds and shears his own sheep not assisted by, in some methods, you know, people will shear them and lay them up on a table and tie their feet and so forth, but this is Australian method. I know in the New River Valley, a uh, tremendous amount of switch over to hair sheep simply because they don't have enough people that are interested in shearing sheep. And uh, so, uh, you know, getting sheep shearers to come into a region that has just a small number of sheep, um, there, at one time, there was enough sheep in, in uh, Buckingham County to the wool would probably fill half of a tractor and trailer. And now you can haul all the wool in Buckingham County on the back of a pickup truck. Thomas says the world market price for fine wool has been depressed for three years because sheep farmers in Australia and New Zealand stockpiled their excess wool and created a supply backlog. Since he doesn't get much money for his wool, Thomas now raises sheep as a sideline to his cattle business. And he's found a new market for his lambs with local 4-H and Future Farmers of America students. This is a very economical, a very safe project for 4-H and FFA kids. They can have it for 90 to 100 days and be in and out of the business. It's not a long-term project, but they still learn the responsibility to take care of the animal, break into them and care for them, and have that agricultural experience without spending a lot of money. Uh, if you get in the horse project or if you get into a uh, uh, cow project, a uh, show steer, you can tie up several thousand dollars real quickly and then uh, and not have a way to recapture that money. Uh, but And also there's always a possibility, a liability of getting hurt. It's pretty hard to get hurt, you know, ha handling a show lamb that weighs 100 pounds. Sheep are an economical and viable livestock option for Virginia farmers who have pastures not suitable for cattle. They will graze on just about any type of grass, everything except bull thistle. The cooler climate near the mountains of Virginia is also ideal for sheep production. And the market for lamb meat continues to grow, especially in urban areas with large immigrant populations. On the negative side, predators like coyotes can destroy a farmer's flock over time. So there are plenty of challenges for sheep farmers like Thomas. But he's hoping Virginians will see flocks of sheep out in the pasture for many years to come. In Buckingham County, this is Dave Miller. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay